So uh, welcome everyone uh, to one more colloquium. So today uh, it's a real honor to have uh, Stuart Kaufman here with us. So Stu is a, is a theoretical biologist and a complex systems researcher, and uh, he studies the origins of life. Uh, he graduated from Dartmouth in uh, 1960. He was awarded the Bachelor of Arts in Oxford University in 63 and completed a medical degree at the University of California in San Francisco in 1968. Uh, he held various positions at the University of Chicago, the National Cancer Institute and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Stu is a very well-known figure. Uh, he, he holds many prizes and patents. Uh, he's one of the founders of uh, complexity theory, uh, and with uh, Balivet in 1985, he filed and held the founding patents on high diversity molecular libraries, which are now a world industry with which is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, Stu published uh, 400 articles, over 400 articles and six books, and I was blown away recently when I read one of his books under a recommendation of uh, George Svetlichny, who's also here uh, watching the, the talk. So I decided to write to an email and we've been chatting and discussing all sorts of uh, wonderful things uh, since then. So Stu, without further ado, thank you once again for accepting to give this talk. So I'm going to share your slides now and let me know if you can see the screen. Yes. Can you see? Yes. Okay. So uh, I will just ask you next slide, please. Um, right. I'm so I'm truly glad, Diago and, and George, that you've invited me to talk. Uh, the last time I talked in front of physicists was October 17th, 2019 at the Perimeter Institute. Um, and I have done what I think is important work since then with wonderful Andrea Roli, he's a computer scientist roboticist in Bologna. And I want to tell you about what we've done since briefly. Uh, and uh, I won't have, I don't have a PowerPoint for it yet because I have not had an opportunity to give a talk. So forgive me, but, but uh, I will be quite astonished and curious to see how you respond. You are mathematicians and physicists, and I think I will annoy you, but I'm not trying to be mean. I'm going to try to take you from this talk that I'm giving. Let me tell you that a, a year ago in January, uh, Andrea and I found ourselves wondering the following thing. If you are talking about the evolution of new adaptations in an evolving biosphere, for example, the evolution of flight, or the evolution of feathers from thermoregulation to flight feathers, or the evolution of the loop of Henle in your kidney. Um, can you deduce that evolution? And the conclusion we have come to, which we first wrote convincingly in the paper, The World is Not a Theorem, and we had up online January one or two last year, is that you cannot. And the title of that paper is the world is not a theorem. What we claim in that paper is, you can use no mathematics based on set theory at all to deduce the ongoing evolution of biosphere when new adaptations keep emerging. That's now published in Entropy to my surprise and delight. Uh, and it's a corollary that if you cannot deduce the evolution of a biosphere, and if an evolving biosphere is part of an evolving universe, there can be no final theory of the kind that Weinberg wanted or the God equation that Kaku wants. So the paper that we now have is entitled The Third Transition in Science, the first being Newton and the Newtonian paradigm, the second being quantum mechanics, which remains in the Newtonian paradigm, to this strange new result that we're getting that you cannot do the evolving biosphere at all. I had not gotten there a year and a half ago or two and a half years ago, that if we, if, 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 if I may, I'll just go through where we were uh, in October 
whatever it was, two and a half years ago, that I hope I can ad lib where we've gotten since. I know something strange is going on for an interesting reason. Uh, when the world is not a theorem was online on archive, I sent it independently to four major physicists, to a major philosopher, and to a Nobel laureate. And I asked each of them, we think we have proved that you can't use set theory to deduce the evolution of the universe. We may well be wrong. Please critique it. I heard from none of them. So I sent it a second time. And what I heard back again was from none of them, except the Nobel laureate in economics said, I'll respond to you after the epidemic, the pandemic. This is a very sane response from a bunch of really smart people. Either I was being a pest, or they're very busy, or there's another possibility. They didn't want to see it. But I actually think that's what's going on. This will sound grandiose, but I think that what, uh, I'm not grandiose, I just love what we're doing. When, when Galileo uh, told the Catholic Church that there were four moons rotating around J Jupiter, it was not welcome news. It meant giving up a 1200 year cosmology. I want you to please listen to what I'm saying. If Andrea and I are right, we cannot use the Newtonian paradigm that is, we've lived with since Newton 335 years ago. That's the framework for all of our science in physics, basically in physics, classical and quantum. The price sounds high, but it's not. Beyond it is a stunning freedom and creativity. So that's the long introduction. So this was the talk, the end of a physics worldview, the watershed of evolving life, uh, tied together with Giuseppe Longo, a mathematician at Ecole Normale in France, and Nael Monteville, uh, now in the Basque country. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to read this. So you all know this, but let's get it said and straight. Newton's, I want to talk about the Newtonian paradigm that Lee Smolin has brought to my attention. Here it is. You have laws of motion in differential form. You have initial and boundary conditions, but the initial and boundary conditions, uh, well, I'll just say it. You just have initial and boundary conditions, then you define an initial state and integrate to yield an entailed trajectory in a pre-stated phase space. So the canonical example is billiard balls on a billiard table. Newton's three laws of motion, given four balls, the initial conditions of position of momentum. Well, what's essential is that the boundary conditions of the edges of the table define the phase space of all possible combinations of position for momenta, momenta. This is a phase space. It's a space of all possible states. And it's essential to the Newtonian paradigm that you must pre-state the phase space and it can never change. There is a fixed pre-stated phase space fundamental in all of the Newtonian paradigm. So pick an initial condition and integrate the equations, uh, stochastic or deterministic, make it deterministic. You get an entailed trajectory of the balls in the pre-stated phase space. Partial differential equations are the same thing. Next slide. So classical physics is deterministic. Classical mechanics, Maxwell's equation, special and general relative, it are all deterministic. The only exception in classical physics is statistical mechanics. Due to the ergodic hypothesis, where the hypothesis is the system spends equal time and equal volumes of phase space. You've given up integrating Newton's equation by the ergodic hypothesis. Given it, you define microstates and macrostates, and you get the second law of the tendency to flow to larger macrostates that have more microstates. It all follows from the ergodic hypothesis. So you've given up integrating Newton's equations, but you are still in a pre-stated six-dimensional phase space. Namely, you have n particles, and for each particle, three numbers specify position in three space and three momentum in three space. So there's six n dimensions. It's a fixed, unchanging phase space. You can open the box and particles flow in and out, but it's still the same framework. In classical physics, as you all know, probability is merely epistemic. Uh, you've still got the same pre-stated phase space or sample space. We have some probability measure and we can define random, 
because we know the sample space, for example, we assume fair dice. It's all going to be essential. We can define a probability measure because we know the sample space, because we're in the Newtonian paradigm. I'm going to show you all this fails for an evolving biosphere. Next slide. So quantum mechanics, it's a crisis in physics. We have Planck and the quantum of action and the reluctant advent of quantum mechanics. Logically, it's determinism, namely quantum jumps between energy levels, for example, the sodium. Of course, we have to take care with respect to Bohm, which is deterministic, but non-local with his, his guiding function. And then there's the vast debate, and Einstein refuses to, that God plays dice, but, because quantum mechanics gives up determinism, except for an interpretation like Bohm's. However, it's still in the Newtonian paradigm. You restate the phase space, the Schrodinger equation is linear partial differential wave equation, and you state your boundary conditions and initial conditions, you integrate Schrodinger's equation, and you get an entailed trajectory of a probability distribution. Then if you wanna know what happens, you collapse the wave function one way or another, and on, on Copenhagen, it's indeterministic and the Born rule and so on. Next slide. So quantum mechanics is still within the Newtonian paradigm. Namely, quantum processes are still in a pre-stated fixed phase space at a deterministic trajectory of a probability distribution of that phase space, and then measurement of measurements real. So Feynman path integrals are the same thing. For the same, for so it's the same for quantum field theories generated by particles and symmetries. It's the same for the standard model of particle physics. This is the reductionist dream of a final theory. All the explanatory arrows point downwards at Weinberg, and the birth of the and the birth of this modern reductionist dream is really Laplace, who says, "If I knew all the positions and moment of all the particles." a vast calculating machine in the sky, uh, Laplace's demon, uh, could calculate the entire future and past of the universe. That is, the modern version of reductionism is born with Laplace. This ignores deterministic chaos, which doesn't change anything. Let's see if I, next slide. So, but in deterministic chaos, it's still in the Newtonian paradigm. You have the three body or more problem, uh, gravitation and Poincaré showed uh, you can't integrate the equations. Uh, so, so you have to do numerical integration, but it's still in a fixed phase space. You now have sensitivity to initial conditions. So determinism no longer means as Laplace thought the capacity to predict. But in the last 50 years, doubts have been growing about reductionism among physicists. The first is Nobel laureate Philip Anderson, who wrote More is Different in Science in 1972, which is just 50 years ago. And he considers cases like chirality, dipole moment and large models as examples of symmetry breaking. And you, you cannot deterministically deduce the way the symmetry will bro be broken. The pole standing up in the middle of the room has the rotational symmetry of the plane. When it falls over, it picks a direction. And Robert Laughlin says the same thing in the universe from a a the bottom down. It's of interest that, that uh, uh, Phil Anderson and Bob Laughlin are solid state physicists dealing with lots and lots of couple degrees of freedom, uh, not like high energy physics. Then there's deriving the Navier-Stokes equations from cellular automata, which Leo Kadanoff did among others. This is showing that new laws emerge at a higher level but they need not be reduced to a lower level. So if the claim is correct that new laws arise at a higher level that cannot be reduced to or deduced from the lower level, strong reductionism may be invalid. So again, new laws may not be reducible to fundamental laws. If so, reductionism in its strong sense fails and emergence is real. Pause. I'm going to tell you guys something very much worse. What emerges at higher levels are living organisms, and we can write no equations whatsoever for their evolution. So not only will it not be the case that we get higher level laws that cannot be reduced to lower level laws, we can't get any higher level laws at all. If I'm right, this is a third transition in science. We resubmitted our paper to Nature, where it was turned down, and I think it's under consideration now. And its title is A Third Transition in Science. And I sent Thiago uh, and George 
uh, copies of it. You're absolutely welcome to read it. Uh, just keep, treat it as confidential now. I hope it gets published. An earlier version of it is online under the title The Third Transition in Science with a long subtitle last July. So the ideas are essentially available there. Okay, next slide. So here it is, new larger crisis for physics worldview. There's no entailing laws at all for involving biospheres. Anywhere in the universe, if there's more than one biosphere. So again, at least in the cases above, there are laws that may or not be reducible to the fundamental laws, so to particle physics and general relativity. As I said, we were about to say, there's no entailing laws at all for involving biospheres. So obviously this is really a radical claim. Next slide. I'm saying it again, a new bigger crisis for the physics worldview. There's no entailing laws at all for the evolution of this or any biosphere. Not, not a bene, with an estimated 20 to the 22 solar systems, well, stars in the universe, and almost all of them have solar systems. How many, how many, how many biospheres are there? Are there 10 to the 22 biospheres or 10 to the 16th? Uh, I, I, among others, have been working on the origin of life, and there's good grounds to think that it's essentially inevitable. Uh, there's no entailing laws for all of them, for any of them. And I wrote a book, my last book about this, entitled The World Beyond Physics, 2019, where I hope I explain my view about this. Next slide. So the first thing to tell you on this pathway is that the universe is not ergodic. So what do we mean by ergodic? So it's the standard statistical mechanics. You put the milk in the coffee cup and you stir it and it becomes a uniform light brown. So it's just the second law having gone to equilibrium. Before a system has gone to equilibrium, while the milk is not yet well, well stirred, it's not ergodic. I realized about 10 years ago that the universe is not ergodic at all above the level of, of, of atoms of about 500 Daltons. So Gabor Vate and I showed this, but let me try to, well, let me get there the following. So here's the Big Bang and nucleosynthesis. We get about 98 stable atoms. Then we get the formation of simple and ever more complex molecules. Consider now all possible proteins length 200 amino acids. So there's 20 kinds of amino acids to consider. And if you think of a protein with 200 amino acids in it, glued end to end with peptide bonds, there's 20 raised to the 200th possible proteins of 200 amino acids. Well, 20 to the 200th is 10 to the 260th. That's a lot. The fastest time scale in the universe is 10 to the minus 43rd seconds. And there's about 10 to the 80th particles. How long would it take at a 10 to the minus 43rd time scale with 10 to the 80th particles doing it and ignoring space like in uh, uh, act distances? Uh, how long would it take to get all of these proteins once? And the answer is it's 10 raised to the 37th time, the lifetime of the universe, to make all possible proteins length 200 just once. Stop and hear it. This is really fundamental. That's for proteins length 200. Bacteria have proteins length 1500. You have a protein in you length 35,000. So if we are to consider the space of all the possible, the universe will never make all the possible. And, and again, I, <clears throat> Gavar Vate and showed the universe is ergodic having made all possible of about 500 Daltons. It's grossly non-ergodic after that. And that means something new and physically important. The universe won't make all possible complex things. As an example, the Murchison meteorite, which landed in 1967 in Murchison, has about 80 or 90,000 different kinds of molecules on it, organic molecules. So the universe is not ergodic. That means something fundamental and it's physical. Most complex things will never exist. Pause. It is true. Most complex things with a mass of whatever it is to be more than 500 Daltons will never come to exist. This isn't planets. This is a complex combinations of molecules and so on. So I'm going to define a notion I have been promulgating for years. It's the idea of the adjacent possible. 
The adjacent possible is what can arise next, given what is actual now. For example, new never before born molecular species in the history of the universe up until now. So the universe is advancing into its adjacent possible. So the universe evolves into its ever new adjacent possible at the levels of molecules and living things. Next slide. Again, most complex things will not exist. So this is the fundamental step to life. One way to exist in the non-equilibrium universe is to be a Kantian whole. So I'm going, a Kantian whole is obviously named after Immanuel Kant. So I'm going to define a Kantian whole. I think he had many, many, many marvelous ideas. This is one, and I picked it up and used it. What Kant said is an organized being has the property that the parts exist in the universe for and by mean of its whole, of the whole. So we are all Kantian wholes. Thiago is a Kantian whole. Thiago exists because he's got a liver and a kidney and a spleen that keep Thiago alive. But Thiago being alive keeps his heart, liver, and spleen alive. Does that make sense? It's a fundamental notion. There is a whole and parts. And, and that's, that's a Kantian whole. All living things are Kantian whole. An example of this is, is the notion of a, a collectively autocatalytic set. So about 50 years ago, I invented the idea that a set of small proteins could mutually catalyze one another's formation. They exist. Donan Ashkenazi in the Ben-Gurion has nine peptides, but peptide one catalyzes a reaction gluing two fragments. Peptide one makes a second copy of peptide two by ligating the two fragments, which when lighted are a second copy of peptide two. Peptide two ligates two fragments of peptide three into a second copy of peptide three, so around until nine recreates one. It's collectively autocatalytic and it's a Kantian whole. And in fact, it's the simplest example of a Kantian whole. The parts are the peptides, the whole is the collectively autocatalytic set. Gonan's got one and it is true of that set which propagates in his lab that the parts, the nine peptides, exist because they are members of the whole. Now comes something really fundamental that you cannot do in physics. What is the function of your heart? Well, it's pump blood. But your heart makes heart sounds and, and uh, your heart, when it pumps, makes water, the fluid in the pericardial uh, chamber vibrate. Those are not the functions of the, the, the heart. So there's been a debate about what function means in biology, and here it is. Take the collectively autocratic set of nine peptides. The function of peptide one is that causal consequence, which is a subset of all of its causal consequences that supports the whole. So the function of peptide one is to catalyze the formation of a second copy of peptide two. If peptide one vibrates or jiggles water in the plate, that's not the function of peptide one. So once you have an autocatalytic set in a Kantian whole, you can do something that you can't do in the rest of physics. You can define the function of a part unambiguously. The, the, the whole gets to exist because of the causal consequence of the part. And notice that the causal consequence of a part that's a function is a subset of its causal consequences. It's pumping blood, not making heart sounds. Onward. So there it is. The definition, the function of a part is its causal role in sustaining the whole. Again, the function of is a subset of the causal consequences, so it's not reducible to physics. Physics can certainly say what all the causal consequences are, but it can pick out a subset as being particularly relevant. Again, the function of the heart's to pump blood, not jiggle water in the pericardial sac. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so here's something that is important to say. Every living thing around is instantiated by physical material. And in that sense, obviously, is dependent upon the physics such that those materials can physically exist. But in addition, living things have parts that have functions, and you can't talk about or reduce functions to physics, which is where we're going. Again, vertebrates have hearts that most complex will not exist. So why do hearts exist in the universe? So why? Why? Why are there hearts? 
Well, vertebrates are organism. Humans are a Kantian whole. You exist formed by means of your heart, so you're a Kantian whole. Darwin's account of the evolution of the heart is a selective advantage. And it's good to have a heart pumping blood because it's good for you. But Darwin is also an account for why hearts exist at all in the non ergodic universe above the level of atoms. Life emerged, hearts evolved to sustain Kantian holes. And here's a way to think about it. How do hearts evolve? Well, life emerged and early on something evolved that might be a heart. The, the, the evolving organism has offspring that propagate the parts that evolved to sustain the whole better. So hearts evolved to function better because the whole organisms which they sustain lives longer or whatever is to be fitter. So selection acts at the level of a whole, the evolving whole evolves and with it, the parts evolve their efficiency and causal consequences that are of use to sustain the whole. This is the opposite, by the way, of Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene. Dawkins has not got the idea of a Kantian whole and he thinks of the organism as a vesicle or a vessel and he's right, but that's just wrong. Next slide. So now we want to ask the following. The phase space of biological evolution must include the function of parts that sustain the whole. For example, hearts pumping blood. Why? Because functions explain why and how these things, hearts came to exist in the non-ergotic universe above the level of the atom. So consider an elephant in uh, Zambia, and on a hot day, it's using its tongue to squirt, squirt water on itself. The fact that the elephant can squirt water on itself may help the elephant survive. Therefore, a function of the trunk of the elephant is to squirt water on the elephant and keep the elephant alive. Therefore, squirting of water on the elephant by the elephant is a part of the phase space of, of the biosphere because it's how common elements got to exist. I want to distinguish between diachronic versus syn synchronic science. The evolution of life in the past 3.7 years is diachronic. How your heart works now is synchronic. Presumably synchronic can be explained by physics, but the coming into existence of the <laughs> universe cannot be explained by physics alone. So my book will world beyond physics. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So again, hearts came into existence as parts of evolving an organ that stained them, but the organ is selected at the level of the whole organism, the Kantian whole. This is downward causation. Selection acts at the level of the whole. The organism survives as a whole in its world. The explanatory errors point upward. It's downward causation, and it's not what Weinberg thought. We cannot explain the coming into existence of hearts in the universe merely as building up of its parts. The heart is co-created evolution along with the evolving Kantian whole that the heart sustains. So this is, this is it. Thus, ex reductionism states the whole is assembled from its parts and exists, exists due to that assembly, like a pile of bricks. Uh, for example, complex molecules fails for evolving organisms. And the fundamental reason is it's downward causation. And it's not a mystery. The organisms where selection acts on the whole survive those that don't, don't. So the coming into existence of hearts, flagellar motors, feathers, hearing, and sight are part of the becoming of the universe. But it's a part that are due to downward causation. Next slide. I'm now going to show you that we cannot pre-state functions which is where I was two and a half years ago, Andre and I have got to the stronger statement that you cannot deduce new functions. I'll try to get to that. We've gone beyond where we were a few years ago. So I want to use the word jury rigging. Um, I don't know the words in Portuguese or Spanish for jury rigging. In French, it's bricolage. So jury rigging is in English is you have some problem that you want to solve, like you have a leak in your roof and you go to the garage and you find seven or eight things in the garage that you can put together using each of the things in a novel way so that together they seal the, 
the hole in the roof. That's jury rigging. It's an example of using things to accomplish tasks for which they were not designed. In other words, you are using the unused causal consequences of the things that you find in the garage. So I'm going to give you a fun example, and I, I got back to it later. Um, let's consider an engine block. So it's a big chunk of, of steel. Uh, it's, it's about, uh, I don't know, a half a meter long and a third of a meter wide and a third of a meter deep. And you drill six or eight holes in it. And those become cylinders and you make a piston. It's really true that a number of years ago, some engineers were, were trying to make a tractor. And uh, they realized they need a huge chassis. So they got a chassis. Um, and they put a huge engine block on the huge chassis. And the chassis broke. So they got a bigger chassis. And they put the huge engine block on it. And the chassis broke. After about five tries, one of the engineers said, you know, the engine block is so big and rigid, we can use the engine block itself as the chassis. And that's how tractors are made. And so it's formula racing cars. What is at stake here is something fundamental that we don't think about it. It's that any physical thing has indefinitely many different uses. And I'm going to show you in a bit that you cannot deduce the different uses from one another. Next slide. So I was here some years ago. Uh, Thiago or George, what is the, how do you say in, in Portuguese a screwdriver? You are at the right spot, Thiago. Do you all know what a screwdriver is? A sharp defender. Sharp defender. Yes. Sharp defender. Okay. I'm going to talk about what is it? Whatever, a screwdriver. I want to try to talk about how many uses of a screwdriver there are uh, in Toronto, because I was the perimeter, or in Rio de Janeiro today. Well, you can screw in a screw, but you can scrape putty from a window. You can prop a window open. You can scratch your back. You can tie, the, tie it to a stick and spear a fish. You can rent the spear for 5% of the catch. You can leave, lean the uh, screwdriver uh, against a wall and put a piece of plywood on it and put a wet oil painting under to keep it dry. So here was where I was a number of years ago. Is the number of uses of a screwdriver definite, like 67, indefinite, or infinite? So what do you think? Are there seven uses of a screwdriver or 83? Well, no. Uh, is it infinite? Well, I, 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 I'm going to have to get, let's go through this. My claim is going to be that the number of uses of a screwdriver is not definite. This is a huge statement. Not definite or indefinite does not map to the real line. So it's a big move to say indefinite. So let's hold for a moment to the number of uses indefinite. Now let's think about, uh, let me put in here what we've gotten to since then. So let's take the engine block and ask what it can be used for. Well, it can be used to make an engine. You drill eight holes in it. They're perfect for storing wine. The engine block is rigid, so you can use it as a chassis. But here's something very important. The engine block can be used as a paperweight. You can hold down a pile of papers. But about two years ago, I realized in a burst of creativity, an engine block has sharp corners so you really can't crack open the coconut against the corners, correct? Now I wanna ask you, here's one thing and it's got a bunch of different uses. If you're using the engine block as a paperweight, can you deduce that you can use it to crack open coconuts? And the answer is no, because the paperweight might be a little piece of chewing gum that works as a paperweight, but you crack open coconuts. This means something fundamental. It means in general, given one use of an object, you cannot deduce the other uses. Do you all see it? This is a big point. You cannot deduce from the use of an engine block as a paperweight. It's used to crack open coconuts. Furthermore, if you use Bayesian updating and have used a paper, an engine block as a paperweight 10,000 times, you might get really good at using engine blocks as paperweight, but you will never deduce that you can use it to crack open coconuts. 
What happens in evolution over and over and over again is that the same physical thing comes to be used for a different purpose by a different one of its causal properties. So that doesn't give us indefinite yet, but I'll come back to that. So now I want to talk about mathematical scales. There's nominal scales, partial ordering, x is greater than y, y is greater than z, interval, like a thermometer, and ratio scale. What kind of a scale are the uses of screwdrivers? It's a nominal scale. So there's no ordering relationship among these uses. Now, here's where I was two years ago. We've since proved it. So let me try to say it now completely. And so here's where we are in the paper you're looking at now. Can we list all the uses of a screwdriver? No, because a thousand years from now, there might be a new use for a screwdriver. Nobody could have used a screwdriver a thousand years ago to shorten electric circuit. Who knows what we'll use a screwdriver for in a thousand years? We cannot list all the uses of a screwdriver. Can we list all the uses of an engine block? No, we can't. Can you, I, I've disappeared. Can you get me back? Um, no, I can see you. Stu? Hang on. Am I there? Yeah, I can see you. I can see you too. What? I can I see you too. Adobe Flash Payer just came in and uh, ruined me. Hang on. I might have to log in again. Let me log in again. I'm sorry. So I'm going to now, I'm going to join Zoom again. Okay. Can you hear me? Dá para me ouvir? Adobe came in and interrupted me. So here's okay. the critical that is in the third transition in science, and the world is not a theorem. Can we list all the uses of a screwdriver? This is not in this thing. This is a year after. Let's just hang there. Uh, so we've done uses of a screwdriver in normal scale. So can we list all the uses of a screwdriver? No, because a screwdriver might be used for things nobody ever thought of, or might become of use in a thousand years in a new way. Can we list all the uses of an engine block? No. So jumping past this to where Andre and I got a year ago, the first axiom of set theory is the axiom of essentionality. It says two sets are identical if and only if they contain the same members. But we cannot show that the uses of a screwdriver are identical to the uses of an engine block. Therefore, we cannot use the axiom of extensionality with respect to uses of things. So this is the heart, and there's a bunch of mathematicians. Let me say it again. We cannot list all the uses of a screwdriver and we cannot list all the uses of an engine block. Therefore, we cannot prove that the uses of an engine block is identical to the uses of a screwdriver. Therefore, we cannot assert the axiom of extensionality. We cannot say that two sets are equal. We just can't. If we can't do that, we cannot use the axiom of extensionality. And it follows that we can't use set theory. And there's more. Uh, the axiom of choice, as you all know, is a very strange axiom that allows one to do lots of things like take limits. The axiom of extensionality is equivalent to the axiom of well ordering, but the uses of a screwdriver are a nominal scale, so they're not an ordering. So we can't use the axiom of choice. Furthermore, and this is beyond where we are here, 
uh, if we cannot use the axiom of extensionality and we cannot use the axiom of choice, how does, how does uh, Russell define the number one? It's the set of all sets with one member. Well, that would be the set of all objects with exactly one use. That makes no sense. Nor does the null set, the set of all objects with zero use, at least not for things in the biosphere. So we can't define a specific number like seven, and we can't define a specific number like eight. Therefore, we cannot define seven plus eight is equal to 15, nor can we define seven plus X is equal to 15. So we can't do equations. Uh, we can't do irrational numbers, so we can't get the real line. We can't do imaginary numbers, so we can't get we can't get the complex plane. We can't get I, I, we we can't get octonions. Now another way to try to get numbers is piano axioms. You have to define a zero element and a successor relationship, but we can't have a null set. We have no successor relationship because the uses of things are are not ordered. So we can't use set theory. That means we can't write equations like three plus seven is equal to whatever it is. And we can't write differential equations and we can't integrate them if we did because we don't have the axiom of choice that you need to take limits. Basically, we're fucked. It's possible that you could get beyond this using category theory, but probably not. So this is, this is where we've gotten to more recently in the world is not a theorem. And that implies that there's no algorithm that can compute all the uses of a screwdriver or the next use of a screwdriver. But we keep finding new uses of screwdrivers all the time. For example, James Bond in a crisis uses a screwdriver to do what? These new uses are typically not prestatable. The issue is not unpredictable, but unprestatable. Let's go to the next slide and see why. So uh, let me branch off from this. Um, what does non-predictable mean? Well, I have a, a, a coin and I toss it a hundred times and I want to know whether or not it will come up heads 53 times. I don't know what will happen, but it's critical that I know what can happen. Uh, this is not in what I've written here. So uh, I know the sample space of the process. There's two to the hundredth possible outcomes of flipping the coin a hundred times. And I wheel up the binomial theorem so I can calculate the probability of 53 heads, but I know the sample space. The biosphere evolves into its adjacent possible, finding new uses of things. Uh, and I may have said this here and I haven't gone back over it, but we, we, we cannot say what is in the adjacent possible. We do not know the sample space. So we don't have a probability distribution. We can't even define random because you need a probability distribution in a sample space. So now let me see where I got to a couple of years ago. And it's the fundamental notion that evolution finds new uses for screwdrivers all the time. They're called Darwinian pre-adaptations or acceptations. So what Darwin said is uh, organs, organs used for one function may come to have another function in evolution because they will have a causal consequence useful in the new environment. My favorite case, is that some fish evolved swim bladders, which tune neutral buoyancy in the water column, and they evolved from lungs of lungfish. So a swim bladder has a ratio of air and water in the, in the swim bladder, and that allows the, the fish to detect neutral buoyancy. And they did evolve from lungfish, and some lungfish, a lung and a lungfish got filled with some water, and now it's poised to evolve into a, a swim bladder. It is a new use of the same thing, the lung of the lungfish, which is now a swim bladder. But neutral buoyancy is a new function that arises in evolution. Could you pre-state it? No, you cannot pre-state the emergence of this new function. So the specific evolution of the biosphere is not pre-statable. More strongly, it's not deducible, which is where we got in the next two years. Next slide. We cannot deduce the evolution. So the evolution of the biosphere creates its own future possibilities um, of becoming without selection achieving it. I was so astonished when I realized this. What a funny sense. Suppose a swim bladder now exists. So we've got fish with swim bladders. 
Could a worm species or a bacterial species evolve to live only in swim bladders? Sure. So the swim bladder is an empty adjacent possible niche into which a worm or bacteria may come to live. Of course it is. So let me, I, I don't know quite what I have in the next slide. So did natural selection work to craft a functioning swim bladder? Yeah. Did natural selection work to achieve a swim bladder that could be an adjacent possible empty niche in which a worm could evolve? No. That means something astonishing. The, the evolution of the biosphere is creating structures and things which enable, but do not cause, the worm to come to live in it. In other words, the evolving biosphere is creating the new possibilities, the new empty niche into which evolution can, can, can come. So is the evolving, so is the evolving global uh, economy. So the worm could come to live in a niche. Natural selection didn't make a swim bladder such that a worm could come to evolve in it, but the worm does. And the worm living in the swim bladder creates new empty niches uh, that selection didn't operate on. This means something stunning. I'm not saying it as clearly as I might. I may in the next slide. The evolving biosphere uses selection to create new structures with new functions. And those new structures and functions enable, but don't cause, new opportunities and directions for selection and evolution to go. The evolving biosphere is creating its own future opportunities, then going into some of them. So is the global economy. This is nowhere in physics, and it's magical. Next slide. So I'm sorry, I said this, let me say it. Selection presumably acted to fashion a functioning swim bladder. But did selection act to create the swim bladder in order to create an empty adjacent possible niche? No, I'm sorry I'm repeating myself, but there it is. But it's so stunning. Without selection doing it, evolution is creating its own future pathways of unrestatable becoming. More strongly now, non-deducible becoming. You cannot deduce what's going to happen. It's not just that you can't state it. Next slide. So let me modify pre-state to include non -deducible. Therefore, we cannot pre-state. In fact, we can't even deduce the relevant variables or functions in the evolving biosphere, neutral buoyancy, flagellar motors, evolve, feathers evolved from thermal legs and co-op flight. We cannot pre-state and we cannot deduce what is in the adjacent possible of the evolution of the biosphere. Therefore, we do not know the sample space of the process. Therefore, we have no probability measure at all. Therefore, we cannot define random with respect to a probability measure. Therefore, we cannot do just statistics in any normal way. This is a bit repetitive, but it's, I'm glad, I hope that you will just accept that I'm telling you things for more than one time. They're so strange when you first run across it. Nobody thinks you can't do statistics. If you think you can, try to be a venture capitalist and figure out what's going to work in the economy next. You can't do any statistics. You have no idea what new goods and services are going to come into existence, but it's happening. And if Andre and I are right, you cannot deduce it using anything from set theory. So the world is creative in a way we can't say. Next slide. So here we get to it. The phase space of evolution persistently changes in ways we cannot pre-state, and I know it, and cannot deduce. Thus, we don't know the relevant variables, so we can not write no laws of motion for the evolving biosphere. So we also can't restate or deduce the boundary conditions non-circularly. We can't restate the niche of an organism uncertainly from the organism. So we can't integrate the equations of motions we do not have and could not integrate them even if we did because we don't know what the boundary conditions are. So here's where we were two years ago. No laws at all entail the evolution of this biosphere or any biosphere in the universe. More strongly, we cannot use any set theory at all to deduce the new adaptations that will arise. So no laws at all entail the evolution of a biosphere. Next slide. This, this is where we are. Um, please take it in and critique it. For the first time in 350 years since Newton, you're forced beyond the Newtonian paradigm, of laws of motion, initial and boundary conditions, then intended trajectories of the pre-stated 
fixed phase space. There are no pre-stated phase spaces for the evolving biosphere here and on any others that exist in 10 to the 22 planets. World, that depends upon physics, beyond physics. The worlds beyond physics, that depend upon physics but are beyond physics, perhaps is as vast in the universe as physics. Is most of the complexity in the universe in its life forms, and I'm beginning to think so, I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, Maria Cortez, uh, 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 Andrew Little and I have been working for two years on three papers that should come out in a couple of days. Let me tell you, uh, the paper is not out, it should be in moments. Uh, basically what uh, Marina, uh, Marina led us to do is to ask, what's the complexity of a biosphere? So I'm now quoting their work of which I'm a co-author with Lee Smolin. And the standard complexity of the universe, abiotic universe, when you count everything, black holes, dark matter, dark energy, uh, whatever, the total complexity of the, of the universe is E, raised to the 10, raised to the 124th. Andrea and all are getting a number where it's not 10 to the 20. We are getting a number that's vastly larger. It's 10 to the 10 to the something over 200. Uh, one number is 237. One can do better than that. And I've done it in another paper that I hope to have up in a couple of days. Uh, and it's easy to get to it. You have proteins in you length 2000. How many possible proteins are there length 2,000? Well, 22 to the 2,000. That's 10 to the 3,200. 10 to the 3,200 is 10 to the 10 to the 320. 10 to the 10 to the 320 is a lot larger than e to the 10 to the 124th. That means something fundamental, and I'm not talking about it here. It means that the complexity of one biosphere is vastly greater than the presumed complexity of the abiotic universe. And why does that matter? If you assume the Newtonian paradigm and the second law from the start of the Big Bang, then you have a price for the initial conditions of the universe. And it's the reciprocal of E to the 10 to the 124th. And as Penrose notes, that's a really tiny spot for God to throw a dart into. Well, I'm giving you grounds to think it's a lot worse than that. The price of the initial condition may be 10 to the 10 to the 320th. What are we gonna do? Pay the price for the initial state of the universe? We do so only if we keep the Newtonian paradigm in the second law. And I think that there's grounds to, to in fact doubt them. And indeed there's a possible fourth law, I'm back to the slides here. The adjacent phase space of our universe tends to increase. Since we wrote this, uh, uh, Lee Smolin, uh, uh, Andrew Little, and I and Marina have defined a second law, a fourth law, we think. I can't, I don't have the equation to show you. It's, it's the following idea. We, what's the phase space of all possible molecules or all possible organisms in a non-ergodic universe? What, what can we say? We define entropy in a world where we fix the phase space and we can fix all the microstates. In a non-adjacent world, the idea is we count what could have happened, all the, the total possibility that could have come and where the system is now within it. Uh, and I can come back to this. Uh, anyway, it's, it's very, I, I won't even say it. Uh, so I'm not gonna say that. Uh, I think there is a fourth law, but I won't try to talk about it now. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So <laughs> let me summarize. Uh, Physics is spectacular. Uh, general relativity is confirmed to 13 decimal places, so is quantum mechanics. You could compute using quantum mechanics uh, and, and the standard model, all kinds of details about interacting particles in a hadron collider or in, the, in CERN. You compute billiard balls, you could compute chaotic fluid motions, you compute turbulence, you get a little bit lost, you don't know if the Navier-Stokes equation holds in three dimensions. Reductionism starts to fail with, with, with Phil Anderson and Bob, uh, Bob uh, Lochlin, who thought new laws emerge at higher levels that cannot be deduced from lower levels. Schrodinger says the same thing in What is Life? He said, we mustn't be surprised 
if there's new physics and new laws that can't be derived from the old laws, I'm telling you something worse. There's no new laws at all. The biosphere is endlessly creative in ways you cannot say ahead of time. You cannot say ahead of time the new adaptations that will arise because of Darwinian pre-adaptations. And I, I truly believe, given what I've told you from two years ago, a world beyond physics in our unpublished paper, The Third Transitions in Science, I think we're at a transition in sciences of the scale of Copernicus, which sounds incredibly pretentious, and I'm not being pretentious. It's very strange. Uh, so I need you to please take it in and criticize it. Um, and I thank you very much for listening. And I'm open for questions if anybody has the energy. Well, thank you very much, Stu, uh, for an excellent talk. Do we have questions? Please. If anybody has a question, just raise your hands. There's also people behind here and there's additional 30 people in the audience, so. Uh, well, I can see the two people behind you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. So questions, anyone? Sergey has a question. Uh, Thank you. The question. Or Can we try to discuss it with some mathematicians? Gromov, for example. Go ahead, please. Gromov, uh, he kind of thinks about this stuff. I, 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 I can't see you, although you are, you have long hair. <laughs> Go ahead, with a little light on you. Yeah, I think uh, Andrea Roli and I are absolutely confident we're right, but we may be wrong. So it need, we need to be attacked. And if we survive your attack, fine. And if we don't, okay. No, and I, can, I, go ahead. I, I'm not attacking. I just mean the, the, the mathematical uh, examples that, that you spoke that they're from 19th century or beginning of 20th, right? So from middle of 20th century, mathematicians, they think uh, in different terms. So in the last 70 years, uh, yeah. Oh. Well, set theory. Set theory. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and ask, and yeah, the, 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 say in uh, in Paris that there's a person Mikhail Gromov. He promotes different things for mathematicians to think about biology and live systems. That he says the uh, science about mm -hmm. life is much more complicated and exciting than science. Uh, since please, that matter. Please, please speak a little slower for me to understand you. Please say it again. Oh, my, my, uh, so so th th there's this point of view promoted by some famous mathematician, geometer, Mikhail Grom. He's in okay. Paris, Paris and NYU. He says like the, the science of uh, about leaf matter is mathematically much more, should be much more exciting than this uh, science about that matter. And the mathematics of biology, which does not exist yet. Yes, correct. I think the mathematics of physics. Like for mathematicians, yes. he performs all yeah, mathematicians to think in this direction. It's kind of uh, in the same way, way that you promote, I would say. So uh, this is fascinating. What, what Andrea and I are saying is, I know what we're saying. We are literally saying you can use no mathematics based on set theory to deduce the evolution. Oh, but, fine, right, well. but there may be other mathematics. When quantum mechanics appeared, uh, mathematicians had to adapt in some way to, yeah. to help physicists, and, and they adapted, right? Some yeah. new and something solved, like vector spaces. Mathematicians already knew about them, just had to explain how to use, I'll say, matrices yes. and vector spaces. The Heisenberg stumbled across matrices. Yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah, there are a lot of mathematics happened in, say, la la last 70 years, and maybe some. I just can suggest to you to, to give this colloquium to some mathematics also audience. Well, I'm thrilled to have a chance to give the colloquium to you guys. You're a mathematician? Yeah, I'm a mathematician. And Georgia is a mathematical physicist, but also a mathematician. So listen, I, what is it, if you will, please tell me your name. Uh, Sergei Galkin. Sergei what? <laughs> listen, Sergei, can we be in touch through Thiago and George? So that's another one. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, the paper, The World is Not a Theorem, is published, and you have a copy of my paper with Andrea, 
the third transition in science. We think we're right, at least with respect to set theory. I'd love it to have some people like you examine it. Maybe our own argument is wrong, or maybe, as my wonderful friend Giuseppe Longa says, Giuseppe says negative results are very powerful. They drive lots of inventions. If you will take the time to read the third transition in science, the most surprising part of it for me is the fifth part that shows that where the title is emergence is not engineering. Uh, when you read it and you see how cells evolve, and I can say it quickly, every molecule in a cell stands ever available to be co-opted for a new use or new function. But the new uses have to be integrated with one another because selection acts at the level of the whole cell. So new functions are emerging all the time because of silly new uses of physical things like proteins. We cannot save them ahead of time, but they're always integrated because selection acts at the level of the whole. It's astonishing. I, I'm pretty sure we're right. And if that's true, uh, it seems to me that the way to proceed is just, just take section five. Is this guy Kaufman and Rowley, are they right? Is this how adaptations really have it in evolving cells? I think it is. Then ask if that's true, if we can't use any mathematics we have now, what can we use? Uh, there's an amazing woman named Andrea, uh, uh, no, Abby, uh, Abby Devereaux, and she is coming up with the mathematics about the structure of the possible that has all kinds of substructures that she's trying to invent. Abby and, and Roger Koppel uh, uh, did the work. Uh, Andrea Rowley and I are co-authors. Uh, Abby has a paper online she's trying to publish. Here's what she hopes she's proved. Uh, no modeler inside the universe can have a complete model of the universe. And it's basically saying, if you have any finite list of true false variables, you cannot capture all of reality in it. And it's, it's beautiful, but it's also set theory. So then, then it, you know, could one use category theory to get around this? Uh, I, I kind of think not, and I'm working with some mathematicians. And if not a category and not set theory, there's something called infinite category theory. I don't even know what that is, but you do. Type theory, homotopy type theory, model theory, many, many things. But uh, uh, what, what I can suggest, maybe for mathematician as me, it might be more interesting not to see what, what is not possible, but what would you like to have? Can yeah, you, absolutely. Properties. So, it would, it would really... What properties would, is desirable? So I agree completely, Sergey. So uh, if you are willing, uh, and, and Thiago will give you my paper, The Third Transition in Science with, with, with Andrea Rowley, please read it and see if we're okay with respect to set theory. Sit down and think if we're right about this funny final section that emerges is not engineering, then let's really think what new mathematics can be invented. I have no idea, but it could be something really neat. And it may not be deductive in the sense that it may allow you to say things, but it may not allow you to say what specifically will occur. Along those lines, I wrote down an equation four years ago that I called the theory of the adjacent possible. Uh, I was trying to figure out how many goods will you have in an economy next period if you've got n goods in the economy now. And I wrote down an equation. It seems to predict all kinds of things, but it doesn't predict anything specifically. It's predicts some funny statistics. It's some kind of theory of sufficient conditions without there being any necessary conditions. It's, it's, it, there's something in it, but I'm not quite sure what. I would love to be in contact if you're willing. Any more questions from the audience? I'm here because we have four computers here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sergey. Thanks, Sergey. So more questions, guys? Yeah, I was going to make a comment along the lines of what Sergey already uh, said. Uh, that, uh, of course, I already read your book and I, I know about your your ideas and I I think I understand uh, most of them. And I was going to ask what what then would you hope is possible to do, given that you cannot restate uh, the biosphere. What's the next best thing, right? 
which is, is I, more or less what Sergey already commented. About. I could tell you something that we've done accidentally. All right. Uh, so it's in the paper online called The Third Transition in Science is even more grandiose. It said the third transition in science beyond Newton and quantum mechanics called a statistical mechanics of emergence. And it, you, you know the TAP equation, right, Diago? Uh, no, I don't. The, the TAP equation. Yeah, so I wrote three, four years ago, I wrote down a tap, the TAP equation, which I can send you. Okay. It, you start off with, with M things at time T. And the equation says, if you've got M things at time T, how many will you have at time T plus one? Well, you'll have the M things you've got at time T, plus all the new things you can make out of the M T things using one at a time or any possible pair or any possible alter or any subset of the M T. And this process is very interesting. You start with M T small, and for a very long time, nothing much happens. Then it explodes uh, hyperbolically to infinity and finite time in the continuous equation. So it has a pole. And it fits things like uh, the growth of the number of tools in the economy, the growth of the number of species. And I bet it, it, it predicts the shape of the increase in complex molecules in the universe. It's becoming a fourth law, I hope. Meanwhile, if you take theories of autocatalytic sets, you, you, you know, years ago I invented this theory of molecules acting on molecules, they're Kantian holes. They are a model of function. The function of the peptide is to catalyze reaction making the next peptide. So you can put together the theory of the adjacent possible and create in which now the parts get a chance to catalyze the formation of other parts. And you'll get the emergence of more and more things and eventually autocatalytic things. And I think one can hope to make a statistical mechanics of emergence. Uh, and I'm imagining doing it with Andrea after we take a break. He's playing the fuel bow. He's doing something useful. So that's one possible direction to go. Uh, it doesn't predict anything specific. It has the odd property that for anything that comes to exist, you can determine who its ancestors were, and you can determine if it has one or more children or grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So for anything, there's a descent number of descendants, it's really amazing, Thiago. What happens is this thing gives you a descent distribution that's a power law with a slope of about minus 1.0 to 1.3. And uh, Sergei Valverde in Barcelona has analyzed 3 million patents from the patent office in the US. For every patent, you can find who its ancestor is. So you can do descent distribution. It's, it's a goddamn power law and the slope is about minus 1.3. What is this stupid theory predict kind of the hyperbolic increase in the number of species, the number of goods, and a descent distribution. It's, it's a triple whammy. So it might be getting at something important, and it might be an example of something that's mathematical, that's not the Newtonian theory, just different. So that's one hope. But maybe we can use category theory, whatever Sergio's thought. I just don't know. Nice, thanks. Thank you all. Anybody want, wants to ask one final question? Otherwise, let's uh, thank Stu for, for the great talk. Stu, it was very nice to have you well, it's fun. here. Please, if you guys are, you guys, you're physicists and mathematicians, if you, if you have the patience, please read The World is Not a Theorem and The Confidential, The Third Transition in Science. If we're right, it's really important, but we may be wrong. And I will tell you that I can't get anybody to look at it. <laughs> so please do. Yeah, I will, I will uh, publicize that the world is not a theory around the, the people here. And you know, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Bye. Thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye. Tiago, it's a great dude. I try to grow a beard and it's a scraggly gray mess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye-bye.